Hi, um, thank you to the organizers for inviting me and our team and giving us the opportunity to introduce you to our recent work. Um, thank you all also for uh, joining this NLP Summit session. My name is Antoinette Vladimirova and I'm uh, an Applied Medical AI Lead at Rush Information Solutions, part of Rush Diagnostics uh, Division. And I will be presenting today uh, along with my colleague Vishnu Vetrival from John Snow Labs um, on our approaches and learnings on how to accelerate biomedical innovation by combining the potential of NLP and knowledge graphs as part of our current Rush and John Snow Labs collaboration. Hey, uh, everyone. Yeah, my name is Vishnu, as, as Anton and I mentioned. Yeah, I work closely with John Snow Labs, and uh, it's been great working on this project with uh, with Roche um, and Anton and specific. So glad to be here as well. So. Yeah, Thank you, uh, Vishnu. So before we begin, um, I need to briefly go over a disclaimer and let you know um, that Roche has been one of John Snow Labs' customers since August 2018, and that this presentation has been prepared by Roche and uh, John Snow Labs to provide a high-level overview of Roche's use of John Snow Labs products and services. And additionally, nothing contained or stated herein or during the presentation constitutes Roche's endorsement of John Snow Labs products or services. And John Snow Labs is fully responsible for the accuracy and completeness um, for any statements related to John Snow Labs products and services, including the product's uh, performance. So with this, I would like to first give you an idea of what Roche is about and why uh, this team went back on this project. Um, at Roche, we're at work towards a common purpose stated here on the slide, doing now what patients need next. And our company um, has a 125 year history as of this week of advancing the field of medicine and bringing novel treatments and diagnostics to patients. Roche has two main divisions, diagnostics and pharmaceuticals. Having those two divisions under the same roof gives us a really powerful advantage to deliver personalized care healthcare, and we're also developing both internal capabilities along with strategic partnerships to combine knowledge from multiple data sources along with advanced analytics to speed up research and to uncover novel insights in order to improve health outcomes. Um, our goal at Roche Diagnostics is really bold, to innovate diagnostics, shape healthcare, and change patients' lives. We have a culture of innovation and commitment to improve the standard of care uh, by combining science, uh, data, and insights. So for example, we know that early accurate diagnosis is essential to prevent disease and help advance uh, new treatments. And we're working towards expanding patient access to medical value and uh, to the best integrated uh, testing solutions. And at the same time, our focus is also on decision support. And our goal here is to unlock insights from data and leverage those to improve patient care by enabling providers to make more confident and more timely decisions. And last but not least, we're focused on disease management, all the way from diagnostics uh, to th therapeutic solutions by orchestrating the full patient care from A to Z. Uh, the project that we're gonna be highlighting today is focused mainly on getting insights to inform patient care and improve uh, disease understanding. Um, Thank you, Vishnu. So what are some novel approaches that we're exploring to accomplish that? For this project, we're trying to leverage some of the technologies with the highest potential for applications in biomedicine and specifically uh, focusing on NLP and knowledge graphs. Many of you are uh, probably uh, familiar with the Gardner hype cycle shown here, depicting the different stages of maturity and adoption of technologies and applications and their potential to solve real business problems uh, going through several key stages. And then innovation progresses through each of these phases with time, which sometimes takes a couple of years, sometimes even uh, extends to decades. And the vertical axis shows how expectations change as the innovation matures. And NLP, as this audience is probably very familiar with, is one of the more advanced um, on, on this spectrum. Following on the footsteps of computer vision, NLP really matured in the last probably three, four, or five years and starting to deliver real practical value in many areas. Knowledge graphs, on the other hand, are still in a relatively early and, and very active stage of development, yet they're holding a lot of promise and potential. 
And we believe that um, uh, with the marriage of these two technologies, um, it could be especially beneficial uh, to the biomedical field to uncover uh, new insights. Um, next slide, thank you, Vishnu. Um, so why do we care about NLP and knowledge graphs to begin with? Um, in many industries, but especially in biomedical arena and medicine, a lot of the key knowledge is locked in unstructured text in publications, brands, clinical trials, and it's not accessible to experts in a quick and efficient way to uh, be able to make decisions. It turns out that a physician actually needs to read a whole 29 hours a day to keep abreast with the new research. And moreover, it's estimated that the amount of the biomedical literature doubles every three years. And none of us have the time or capacity to keep up with that. That's why we focused on NLP and graphs to be able to extract key pieces of information and link them together to provide a holistic picture that can be um, easily and dynamically interrogated with specific questions to serve scientists or healthcare providers or business leaders that are uh, looking for um, trends information. NLP can help us understand the biomedical text and generate a structured data equivalent. But additionally, there are many siloed databases with biomedical data which are not easy to access, such as those for drug information, disease and symptoms, drug targets and so forth. And uh, the data they contain also is very heterogeneous in their nature. So how do we integrate all these disparate pieces of information and connect all the dots? And it turns out that the graphs are really great for this purpose. They're a very natural way of representing knowledge. Some familiar examples that come to mind would be um, subway maps or biological pathways. Um, and graphs not only include the entities such as potential genes, drugs, or diseases, but also importantly provide the relationships between them, which are absolutely critical to make sense of, of the data. So knowledge graphs allow us to capture those relationships and bring together disparate and complementary information. They can uh, bridge structured and unstructured data. They can also provide the basis for advanced predictive algorithms uh, on top of them, leveraging the topology of the graph and uh, the very uh, nature of this uh, heterogeneous data. So by combining the benefits of NLP and the knowledge graph technologies, um, we believe that we can unlock synergistic effects to provide biomedical ex um, insights to experts to be able to develop more informed decisions, better medications or diagnostics. So, and not surprisingly um, on this slide, you, you see that the trends of uh, publications in the biomedical field that leverage either NLP or graph have been growing exponentially in the last few years. So with that, um, I would like to hand it over to my um, uh, colleague, Vishnu Betterville, to give you some additional insights into why and how we have been leveraging NLP and knowledge graphs for this project. Vishnu, please take it away. But uh, Antonetta, yeah, so just to just to sort of recap what Antonetta was, was, was talking about. So there's this underlying you know, issues with the data and biomedical AI, data explosion being one of them, the fact that unstructured data is glowing at sort of really high rate and greater than 80%. And, and not only that, all the existing data sets are pretty siloed and fragmented. You've got all these different data sets all over the place, uh, but, but they're not really connected. And if they're not connected, then you can't really understand what are the signals uh, that are in between these data sets to be able to infer those, right? And, and as a result, uh, you know, you can't access that information when you need, and also the bias when you start using AI, you know, type type techniques also increases. Now you're only looking at a silo data set instead of looking at the whole picture, right? And so the answer to this, we believe, is really bringing back context, right? So how can we bring back context into not only what the AI algorithms are looking at, but also what we as humans are looking at? So how, and, and you know, and there is a way we believe that if there's a common representation. Um, that exists um, that can bring bring these two worlds together, and and we believe there's there's there, there's like a four stage process in order to bring back context, and we call it contextual AI, and and there's you know we call these four steps: to collect, infer, connect, and discover. I'll go through this in detail in a second, but but that's what we believe is the key to sort of solving this problem. Um, and the first step, I said, collecting the data is always usually the first step. Getting all of these different data sets that are all over the place, things like Wikidata, PubMed, obviously, is a huge source of all the scientific articles out there. The clinical trials database itself, Kemble, and, and many other data sets that we, you know, sort of we brought in. 
Um, and just the diagram on the right sort of gives you an overview of all the different kinds of biomedical entities that that we've represented in these different data sets, right? There's over 27 different biomedical classes of entities. Um, even though Wikidata has most of these, it's not in a form that can be easily used and accessible because of the way it's structured there. It's very sort of, uh, you know, hard to sort of get to, but we have brought these in and, and you know, and then we've actually expanded on these sets of uh, entity types as well. Um, and then once you've brought all this data in, then of course, the second part of the, the puzzle is like, how do you infer what these data sets are actually saying, especially the unstructured data, right? So that's where the part of NLP comes in. Antoinette, you know, talked about this earlier and, and really part of all the John Snow models also kicks in, right? So, so we then run a whole bunch of NER models, uh, like uh, name identity recognition models and also relationship extraction models to be able to extract all of the, you know, not only the entity types that are sort of hidden in the text, um, but also the relationships that exist between, you know, multiple kinds of entities, right? And 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 so then once you've extracted these sort of semantic facts, if you will, or triples, then we can start, uh, you know, going to the next stage of the process of context building, which is really connecting them all together in 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 the form of a graph. Because you can take all these facts and you can throw it into a database, right? And that's what traditionally people have been doing for a long time, which, if you think about it, is sort of a you know, it's it's an okay way of doing things, but but if you don't connect them together, you're losing the context that exists between these facts, right? And the relationships actually is another kind of a signal, like, and that's the signal that you would be losing as a result, right? And so that's why we're big believers of taking this, connecting them to, to a graph, and then leveraging existing ontologies um, also with when you're actually doing this, and doing it in a way that makes sense in the schema of the graph itself. And, and that's the graph you know, um, building stage uh, of, of the process. Once you've done that, of course, then you can start you know, using more of the advanced analytics, the graph analytics, the link prediction, you know, things like that uh, to be able to start, start predicting things and start, start analyzing the graph itself. Uh, to, to surface different kinds of insights and, and then build different kinds of tools catered at different personas within your organization, right? So just to summarize all of this, so you have you know this your collect stage where you're bringing all the different data sets and then you you sort of normalize them into a common data model and then you define your you know and then you start inferring what's actually in the data through powerful NLP and you know NLU and NER models. And once you've extracted all these facts from those data sets, then you start connecting them to the graph uh, itself and then build out your knowledge graph. And of course, then you start like also running your, your computational pipelines, your analysis pipelines on top of the graph to sort of infer even more insights and add it back into the graph. Now you're enriching the graph, right? And finally, that you have all the other insights that you're building on top of the enriched graph um, in terms of models in terms of applications, insights, or you know, other kinds of things like question answer models and so on. And those are the discover phase, if you will. Um, so, so that's sort of what our process was at a very high level. But I'm gonna talk about like what was, you know, the actual numbers behind some of the things we did. Um, so just to sort of step back in terms of the actual graph we've built, um, I'll start with, you know, left to right. So there are over 10,000 different predicates or relationship types that exist in the graph, the, you know, the current graph we've built. Um, most of them are, you know, we've restricted ourselves to the Wikidata predicate types because that is our core schema. And, you know, Wikidata doesn't really allow adding new predicate types. So we stuck with the, uh, with the current uh, types that are available in the Wikidata schema itself. This is of course, in the future state, we might, uh, change the underlying schema, and we might go to a different schema that allows different kinds of predicates as well. But for now, we decided to restrict it to the Wikidata predict types. We've brought in uh, additional, uh, you know, data from the clinical trials database. Now, Wikidata itself had uh, a lot of clinical trials IDs, but it was not filled enough. Like it was not like rich enough. The data did not contain a lot of information that the clinical trials database itself. Had. And this is true of a lot of the things that you would find in Wikidata. So we had to go in and enrich the data that was in Wikidata with additional information, like things like, hey, what, what disease was it ref reference, what was related to, and things like that. And so we had to do a lot of that work on top of what was already present. Um, and there was a total of 85 million entities that the graph contains now. Um, or, and then 
And then also, like I said, the, the core part of the work was to be able to take all of the, the PubMed articles and sort of extract out the facts that they talk about uh, using NLP and NLU models. And it was over 260 million facts that we extracted out along four main corridors now. And, and a corridor is like basically a, you know, an entity to entity relationship, uh, right? So things like chemicals and diseases, chemical genes, disease genes, gene gene. So those kinds of relationships are, you know, what we call corridors. And, 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 and if you, and we took all of this, added it and enriched it on top of, you know, the airline base uh, life sciences uh, subset of Wikidata. Um, and we've added over a billion additional facts on top of what exists. And so for a total of around over 5 billion semantic facts uh, exist in the graph now, out of which, um, and if you think about it, like there's also citations, right? And so there's metadata about the facts that we also added, which is which accounts to the why there, there's like over a billion and over 140 million external IDs and ontological relationships, 100 million and so on. So it's a massive graph, you know, that we're really stretching the limits of the underlying graph database that they were also using, um, but, we're just scratching the surface. There's so much more data sets that we want to bring in, and this is probably going to double in size pretty soon as well. I just wanted to give you a sort of a you know idea of a snapshot of where we are right now with the project. Um, so once we brought this, built this graph, then we wanted to say, okay, so how good is this graph, right? I know, okay, great. There's a lot of facts. There's a lot of a lot of data in here, but how do you truly validate? You know, can it actually answer some of the things that we wanted to answer, right? And so the, the, and and because it's, uh, it's built on um, an RDF uh, sort of database right now. So you can run what's known as Sparkle, which is the, the way to query RDF-based uh, knowledge graphs or graphs. And so we came up with sort of, we hand-built over a thousand um, biomedical Sparkle queries. Um, and we've used this sort of as a baseline to validate how good our graph is compared to say the, uh, the subset baseline that we started with. And we, we have found that, yes, our graph does better in multiple categories compared to the baseline subset. Um, and then just to show you like an idea of like um, some of those numbers and, and what were the numbers across the different categories that, that we've identified across these thousand queries that we, that we built. And like I said, this is just, this is just a starting point. There's, there's so much more data we want to bring in. We, and then the work of actually filling in some of the gaps we're finding, right? Like, and, you know, so, hey, so what, why are these queries not performing as well in our graph? So we want to go in and sort of dig into each of these categories and sort of figure out what are the missing pieces of data sets we need to bring in. And that's the work that, you know, currently we're sort of looking into as well. So, so once again, this is just the starting point and the graph can only get better from, from now on. So that's sort of like a, from a query perspective, like actually writing Sparkle queries to see what the actual graph itself has and ha does not have. But then you think about it from a scientist perspective, not everyone is going to be able to write Sparkle queries um, and, and understand the core you know, schema of the graph itself and things like that, which is really where we wanted to build this sort of natural language query interface on top of the graph through question answer models and so on. And so we sort of uh, used uh, like an existing effort on this on this front uh, known as BioAsk. You know, it's sort of a conference that's been going on for like around nine or 10 years uh, around biomedical question answering. And they have a, you know, uh, over 3,000 3, questions, you know, 3,200 questions that as part of their training data set. And we said, hey, why not, why can't we just use that data set to sort of measure our question answering models and, you know, uh, against that can then query the index, query the graph, and then try to return the answers from both of these places, right? And so, and these are very early results. I have to caveat them by saying that, um, that, you know, even then it seems like we have a great recall percentage, you know, most of the questions come back with answers or 82% of them. But like I said, we, we're still doing, a, still doing a lot of fine tuning work on this and we believe, you know, it's gonna get better and we can start me measuring things like precision and, you know, the F score itself. And our hope is, of course, we can submit for the next next round of BioAsk that's I think coming up in next year. So very early results, but it's very promising, and also is very targeted towards end users who do not have to know Sparkle and other kind of technical things as well to query the graph and just get an answer from it, right? So finally, um, of course, you know, once again, we're very focused on yeah, we built this massive graph, and you know, we validated that it actually has. You know, a lot. You know, a lot of a lot of things that can help answer questions and, and and do the analysis. But then, we wanted to make it even easier for end users, and this is where we built out a user interface. 
where the user can come in and it incorporates all the good the things I've been talking about. But you know, whether it be question answering, graph-based exploration, custom insights that we can build and expose, and of course the API itself. And so just to give you a snapshot of the, the UI we've built, you can come in here, you can search for things, you can ask questions, you can browse the graph, you can look at all the pre-built insights as well, right? Um, and so that way we're sort of bringing everything together in sort of a very usable um, and easy to access um, method for, for the end users, right? I think um, with that, I'd like to you know, take it over for questions and make, you know, and see what you guys, uh, yeah, so.